I've always been a problem solver and that's in everything that I sell. You know, meet the client, get them to like you, figure out what their problems are, provide them with the solution. Hello and welcome to episode 186 of the Smart Agents Podcast. As always, my name is Michael Walter and I'll be your host. On today's episode, we are joined by Richard Lubeck, broker owner of Redline Realty, located in the fast-growing Katy, Texas. Launching his real estate career in 2009, Richard emphasizes the importance of consistency in providing a high level of service to clients. Throughout our conversation, he discusses the challenges and opportunities during the housing market downturn and explosive growth during the COVID-19 pandemic. Lubeck also shares his marketing strategies, which include open houses, social media, video content, and weekly newsletters. But before we get on to the day's featured interview, the Smart Agents Magazine is available and is full of insights and strategies designed to help real estate agents grow their businesses. Inside, you will find interviews and advice from leading real estate professionals, marketing tips to flood your business with leads, and even swipe and deploy files full of practical tools to enhance your business. Subscribe now to receive your copy of the printed magazine each month and instantly get access to our online agent community and members only templates. Click the link in the episode description or go to smartagents.com forward slash magazine. Also, if you enjoy this conversation, be sure to like and subscribe. The Smart Agents podcast streams on all major podcasting platforms such as Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, and YouTube. And finally, if you or someone else on your team has an incredible story or real estate tips to share with our community, send us a message at feedback at smartagents.com. We're always on the lookout for new stories to share. All right, let's get on to the day's featured interview with Richard Lubeck. If you enjoyed our conversation, be sure to follow Red Lion Realty on Instagram. I've included a link in the episode description. Well, really the way I like to start everything out is if you could just introduce yourself to us a little bit. Uh, tell us who you are and where you're at. Sure. Uh, hi, I'm Richard Lubeck. I'm the broker owner of Red Lion Realty. Um, we're in Katy, Texas, which is on the west side of Houston. Uh, it's one of the fastest and largest growing communities in America right now. Uh, and I've been practicing real estate down here since 2009. Awesome. What was it that originally got you into real estate? Because I see you have a, a pretty extensive sales background as well. Um, I actually started brokering businesses with a commercial company in a tri-state region. We were up in Michigan, uh, Indiana, and Illinois brokering bars and restaurants. Um, and I was actually headhunted uh, by that commercial broker. Uh, I was actually in the power sports industry before then. And he brought me up for a working interview for a week. And I decided I liked it. And, and uh, they made me an offer. And I moved forward into it. So Awesome. And then, and then you uh, eventually got your real estate license. What was it about real estate that, you know, made you want to, yeah, I guess, make that change and, you know, get into that space? Um, well, one, I, I got being in dealerships, you're kind of in four walls all the time. So it was a different experience getting outside, meeting, talking to people. And it was just a huge learning curve that brought me to a, a different level. Um, and that attracted me to it. You know, I, I, a lot of people do it for the money. I, I didn't. I just, I've always been a problem solver and that's in everything that I sell. You know, meet the client, get them to like you, figure out what their problems are, provide them with the solution. And hey, if you're the guy for them, great. If you're not the guy for them, great. Let them know that. Um, and that's the, been the foundation of, of my business from day one. Right. When you guys started in 2009, did you start with another brokerage or did you get your license? and? Okay. So how did that go? What was it that, uh, I guess, uh, when you were looking for a brokerage to join, what were you looking for? Um, I interviewed a handful of them. Uh, there's a lot of different paths that you can go down um, from the pay nothing brokerages to paying all the fees. Uh, I, I already had the fundamentals down, um, but I was looking for a broker with mentorship. And that is what Juan uh, provided me with the Elite Texas Properties. I, I started with them. Um, and when I did exit to launch my own brokerage, it felt kind of like I was getting divorced from a family. Uh, but he, Juan was very gracious. We went out, had a nice dinner. We talked and he said, the day I sponsored you, I, I knew you were going to launch your own brokerage. I, I just didn't know when. So but su super nice man. Right. When was it uh, that you did launch your own brokerage? 2017 is when we launched Red Lion Realty, sir. 
Okay, great. So tell me a little bit about, uh, you know, getting started in real estate in 2009. Obviously, we were kind of in the middle of a whole housing crisis and housing bubble and everything. What was I it? came in at the worst time. <laughs> right, right, exactly. So <laughs> well, everybody was running out. I, I was racing back in. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, it's one of those things that if you, you know, obviously it's worked out for you, but, you know, getting in at a time like that, if you really put your head down and do the work, you know, once you get out of that cycle and, you know, kind of come out of that uh, downturn, um, you know, you're there and, you, and you've, you've been established. Um, well, I, I mean, I've predominantly ran businesses for three decades. So I understand marketing and markets. Now, am I a guru? No, I mean, nobody is. There's no crystal ball to it. Um, but one of the things that I learned over the years is that when the market's at the bottom, it, it's mindset. There's still opportunity. You're going to have to work for it but there's nowhere to go but up. And so while they're running out, that allowed me to create a space and a name and pick up market share. And that when it did turn back on, I was already pseudo riding a wave versus them racing in starting at ground zero. So it, 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 it allowed me to get ahead of them. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. So um, when you did get in, what was it uh, that you were doing to market yourself and to get your name out there uh, so that you were starting to uh, pick up that market share? Um, in 2009, uh, a lot of it was working my sphere of influence, um, just calling people, telling them who I am, what I do. And most people look at this telephone like it's a 200-pound gorilla. But I, I didn't start out in the conversation, tell them who I am and what I do. It's, hey, it's Richard Lubeck. Haven't talked to you in quite some time. How are you? How are your family? And I just let the conversation take its own course. Over that time, I have to imagine that, you know, as, you know, the housing market's a little rough, uh, but you're still getting your name out. How did things kind of take off once the market started to turn? Um, well, when it took off, I want to say it was around 2012, we went into flash sales. Uh, now, now, also part of that marketing was more than just calling people. I did tons of open houses. Um, there was limited inventory uh, at that uh, time. Uh, and so I would call other agents and go, hey, can I host an open house for you? I mean, what a better place to meet people that are looking to buy and sell real estate in a two hour window. And it's, it's nothing but people looking to do what we're, we're trying to accomplish. Um, but yeah, when it took off in 2012, um, it, it, it was a wild ride. Um, and when we turned a page, I mean, that's exactly spring of 2012. I, I remember exactly when it took off. I want to say it was around April and it, uh, it ran hard and strong all the way through. Uh, I, I would say it was probably a strong year there. And then we went back to a normal market uh, up through 2019. Uh, and then in 2020, COVID hit. I thought my phone was broken for the first two weeks that that happened. Uh, and then I got a phone call and then it was just like a rocket ship. Once that first phone call hit, I, I, I couldn't, it, it was overwhelming. It was 18 months of just being on a hamster wheel. Right. Absolutely. And I, I want to talk to you about, uh, you know, that here in just a moment, but uh, you mentioned the open houses and I, I think that that's a, uh, open houses are such a great lead generation vehicle that a lot mm -hmm. of people uh, really don't, you know, a lot of people I talk to, they, they, um, you know, really don't enjoy, you know, holding open houses. But I really think for that two hours, you cannot get a better return on investment on people that are actively interested in real estate. Well, you know, an open house, everybody wants the outcome in what we do. But if you're having a crappy outcome, it's because you have a crappy process. And a lot of that's mindset. You know, I, I have agents tell me, oh, open houses, they're a waste of time. They don't work. I believe them. But I also do open houses and I know they work. And I pick up on average um, around $3 million in, in business annually off of it. Mm -hmm. So please don't do open houses. I mean, <laughs> it, it helps me, but but it's your mindset. And you, have, you can't just roll up to a property 15 minutes before the open house, put up one or two signs and expect it to be a success. Yeah, you have no process. I mean, you're, you're spraying and praying. Uh, you know, to give people insights on that, 
And there's enough business for all of us. Uh, there's no shortage of success. There's just a shortage of people trying to achieve it. Um, we start on Wednesdays. Uh, we market the open house starting Wednesday. Uh, we get out early Saturday mornings. The signs are out at 8 a.m. The open house is at 1 p.m. Um, we've invited the neighbors. Uh, and there's 50 or 60 signs that we put out. So, I mean, when you show up, it looks like there's an event going on, whether there's one person at the open house or there's 10 people at the open house. And uh, that's what it attracts people uh, versus chasing them. I mean, attract, attract and engage versus chase and convince is, is another philosophy that we use. Right. Absolutely. So when you say you start marketing the open house on a Wednesday, what are you doing to start uh, building up that, you know, kind of uh, marketing cachet? Um, our MLS is HAR, Houston Association of Realtors. We like to post it on HAR. Uh, we also put it all over social media. Um, Facebook's really good. Uh, Instagram's good. Uh, I mean, there's all kinds of different medias. Um, next door, some neighborhoods allow you to market open houses as an event. Some don't. Uh, LinkedIn's another great area to do it as well. Uh, and then there's threads. I mean, I don't know all of them, but the ones that I see the biggest return on is probably going to be Instagram, LinkedIn, and Facebook. And those are known by everybody. Yeah, absolutely. So um, kind of going back to your uh, uh, your real estate career, career trajectory, uh, when it was time for you to go ahead and, you know, step out and launch Red Lion, uh, what was it that, you know, made you want to do that? Obviously, your entrepreneurial background and everything else in, in business, I have to imagine, you know, the growth and the, the wanting to run your own uh, business. But was there anything else that really, you know, uh, was one of the driving factors? Well, it's I'm trying to think of how to describe it. The consistency factor when you work at other brokerages, most people in our industry are independent contractors. There's no secret in that. Um, our model is a, a client-centric model. And with that said, whether you come to an open house I'm hosting or one of my six agents, it should be the exact same experience. It's the consistency. Um, and I think that's a, a downfall in our industry is that you can have a great experience with Sally Sue Smith, the Realtor at ABC Realty. Um, but in the same sentence, somebody could have a horrible experience with ABC Realty, but they don't remember Sally Sue Smith. They remember ABC Realty. So our primary focus is to have that consistent high level of service uh, that's client centric. So we focus on training, mentorship, fully understanding the documents forwards and backwards. Uh, if you show up to my open house or go to one of my agents, you're going to have the exact same experience, except you're going to hear it from Sally Sue Smith or Richard Lubeck. And, and that was part of that vision is to do that. Yeah. What, uh, how, how many agents do you have uh, under the red line banner? There's six of us practicing. We're a mm -hmm. mom and pop, small local business. Mm -hmm. um, we focus on quality, not quantity. I mean, I could, go out and have 200 agents tomorrow. Um, but we would lose the consistency. So, but yeah, we're just a small mom and pop shop and we're in the top 1% locally. We're, we're small, but mighty. Right. So. Absolutely. Well, and I think but by having that consistency and having that high level of service, you know, that, uh, that does help, you know, bring in those referrals. And like you said, Katie's one of the fastest growing areas in the nation and really, you know, uh, regardless of your size, you don't need to be one of these mega places. If you're, if, if you're providing that top level service, people are going to be coming and calling you. Correct. Yeah. No, in, in our uh, local MLS, we have 51,000 realtors that practice real estate in our market, but out of 51,000, 50% 50 of them did zero to one house last year. Yeah. So, you know, the numbers may look good until you start digging into them and reading the numbers and, and all business is math, sir. Yeah, absolutely. When, so kind of going back to, uh, you know, COVID and how things really took off for you, was that something that, I mean, obviously that, that period of time in the market, I don't think anybody could have ever predicted, but did you ever think that your 
uh, particular market would start growing as fast as it was? It was explosive. I mean, I think the word for that 18 months or two years was unprecedented because that's what everything was referred to. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, I would pull into neighborhoods and you would see uh, 40 slabs of concrete. I mean, they weren't pouring a couple houses like you typically see in a build cycle. I mean, they were pouring whole sections of neighborhoods uh, to be built at the same time. I mean, I I've never seen anything like that. And the there's no way you could have possibly forecasted that. I mean, if you could, man, you're smarter than me. So. Yeah, absolutely. It's kind of, it's a, a lot, uh, it's like my neighborhood that I live in. We, uh, built our house in, uh, we started building in January of 2019 and, you know, they were doing the one or two slabs at a time. And mm -hmm. then right about, you know, a year later, was it March or April, you know, the neighborhood, it wasn't supposed to be built out for another three or four years. And it was built out by the end of 2020. Wow. So you're talking three to four years of business finished in about nine months. I mean, that's, that's incredible, honestly, sir. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, in that time period, what were you doing? Um, you know, it, it sounds like, you know, a lot of business is coming to you, but what are you doing to take advantage of such, uh, such demand and such, you know, the influx of people into your area? Um, I mean, there was lots of challenges. You know, there was clients that were FHA and VA. Um, and if they didn't want a new build, it was a it was a huge challenge to get their offer accepted on a uh, a resale home. Um so it basically was just educating the consumer. That, yes, I know you want this and you're trying to get there, but if you want to buy a house in this market, and again, I don't create it, I, I just work in it. Um we need to go to a new build because a lot of these listings are advertised conventional cash only. I can't even present your offer. And it, it, it was hard on some people. Yeah. I, I don't know how you, because you want something, but you're told you can't, you can't even get a seat at the table or even try to get it. And it was sad. Yeah, absolutely. And, and like you said earlier, you know, about, um, you know, you really, you're there to help, you know, solve people's problems. And, and I do know that, you know, in that time period, it was very difficult for buyers, even if they did, even if they did, you know, qualify for a seat at the table and put it in those offers and things. Getting to crack them on on the bid. Yeah. Right. So we, we saw 30 to 50,000 over asking in some instances. That That's a lot of money. Yeah, absolutely. So when you are talking with those buyers that are going through that, how do you keep them motivated? Um, You know, if this is your house, it's going to work out. If it's not your house, there's a better one coming. M most people kind of figure that out so that when I did land the house, they're like, oh, I'm glad I didn't get the other one. Right. But getting to that point, you're right. It is hard to keep them motivated and focused, uh, especially when you put in 20 offers and you don't make any of the 20 and you're putting in great offers. Now, if you're putting in offers under ask with that, you know, if, if we don't figure that out, the first one or two, then I can't service you at that level because there's there's no way I can help you. I, we we got to help yourself first. Right. In that so, time period, um, how important was it to have a good relationship with, you know, your lenders and for them to be able to educate? Crucial. Yeah, because I have to imagine that would that really the education that they can provide to you, your buyers, you know, when it is coming to those, hey, we we need to bump up our price and, and what that really is going to impact their, their lifestyle and, you know, their monthly payments. Well, I mean, the interest was low at that time. So that afforded people to get a lot more house for their money. Um, but the offset was, was having to come out of pocket with the additional monies in order to win it. Um, and then there was just, sometimes I'd have to have the conversation that we need to drive to qualify for your price range. The price range that you want to be in doesn't exist in this market here. But if we go out a couple miles, um, we can make that work. So, it, and you have to put it into a, a minutes perspective. Oh, well, that's 10 miles. Yeah, but you're talking 10 minutes and we can put you into what you want. Kind of moving from that time frame to where we're at now. And uh, you, like you said, Katie is still, it's a very you know, it's growing. And where are those people coming from? What What's the demographic that is, you know, starting to, or has been moving into your area? Well, we're the place everybody's going to. 
not or not coming from. Um, 250,000 people relocated to our area here last year, and that's just what we know about. Um, so I'm sure that there's more than that. Um, but they're coming from East Coast, West Coast, uh, Midwest, international. I mean, Houston's a huge international city. Uh, if you're in the oil and gas business, you probably have an office building somewhere in Houston, Texas, uh, wh- whether you're a global company or, or whatever. But we're also diversified. I mean, we have tech, we have industrial, we got a little bit of everything. So it's very attractive. Um, we're a right to work state. Uh, there's no state income tax that attracts people. Um, our property tax uh, is, I would say, low, but they also tax you on the assessed value. So, um, I mean, if, if you're paying high taxes on your property, that's probably because you're enjoying a great area with a great school, and that's your offset for that. Yeah. yeah. So, to market to those people that are relocating, are you doing anything? Like you said, you, you talked about LinkedIn. Is that somewhere where you do a bit of marketing to you know, get those relocating business people, you know, the people that are working for those businesses? Um, We work multimedia when it comes to marketing. Um, Yes, we do that. We have a relocation agent that focuses on relocation or groups uh, of agents for agent to agent referrals. We also work with builders. So we tour, we take videos of, uh, You know, what does 300,000 get you in our local market? We put that up on YouTube. Um, And and that gives us exposure to people that they might be in New York going, hey, I'm looking at this area and it puts us in their feed and it gives us exposure that way. Yeah, I I really like that idea of putting those uh, those videos out there, uh, you know, for the people that are relocating, because I have to imagine, you know, if I was you know, if my business was moving me to the Houston area, uh, and I, you know, was doing a search on, you know, what are some of the, the newer neighborhoods or the, you know, the up and coming neighborhoods around the area, your videos will be popping up. And it's definitely something that I would be interested in looking at and reaching out to you. Yeah, we also do, um, this week in real estate, Katie Fulcher, Richmond, um, it is three different cities, but you can't tell that you left one going to the other. They're they're kind of encompassing. Um, so every Monday we put out data that people crave, uh, new listings, pending sales, and sold properties. So we give them the update of uh, what was just listed in the last seven days, what went pending, and what sold in the last seven days. Um, and we give them, like if it's a four-bedroom, two-and-a-half bath, three-car garage, it was 2,576 square feet. And these are just the average homes this week. Um, you know, the new listings came in at 178 per square foot, which puts the average new listing in Katy, Texas at 450,000 this week. So they have a general, uh, 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 parameter of what's happening in our local market. How important is it to be, you know, I know a lot of people will, uh, they will put together those market updates and, but they're just not very consistent with it. How important is it to make sure that you're you're getting that information out on a consistent basis, so that you know you can you're staying in front of those people that are, uh, you know, maybe not ready to move, but mm-hmm. kind of waiting for that right time and you know waiting for that data to come in that says, oh, all right, this crucial. is the time to go. I mean, that that is the new oil in today's market. It is, um, and you have to be disciplined and you have to be consistent. Not only do we market those videos out across all of social media. We do a weekly newsletter. So if you inquire um, and we get your email address, you're going to be put into a newsletter. And that's a mistake a lot of people do is they'll hire a third party outsource and get pre cam stuff and they send it out to their database. Nobody reads that. And they wonder why they have a, a low opening rate. If you give them organic stuff that truly pertains to your local environment and community, um, they're going to open it. I mean, I want to say a newsletter opening rate, a national average that's um, considered a great rate is 7%. We hover between 35 and 40% weekly. Um, but, but again, it's crucial. Every week they're getting in the weekly update. Uh, and then we put other stuff, things to do this weekend. We have a car show coming up or we have uh, a, a market festival. It just, all that changes, but it's all local information, local data. So you get the vibe of what's going on around our area. Yeah, absolutely. And I really like that idea of, you know, putting all the, you know, the local events and the things happening locally so that, you know, 
the people that maybe aren't uh, in that moment looking for the data, they still are going to be opening your newsletters and seeing your face and seeing your name because they're interested in what they and their family could do this weekend. Yeah. And I get people that, uh, hey, we're coming in from New York. We're going to be here at these dates. And uh, they'll see some of that stuff and they'll want to see properties for X amount and go, hey, but we're going to go check out this and this. And we heard about it through you. So, I mean, pe people are reading it and absorbing it. So that's good. Right. What uh, before we wrap up, just tell me a little bit about, um, you know, what, uh, you know, 2024 holds for Redline and then what the, the future beyond that, what are your, your hopes for the well, company? 2024 is an election year. I mean, that's off camber historically. However, um, I can tell you this year started off with a bang. Um, I think just at my personal production, I've already got five under contract in January, which is notoriously a slow month in our business. Um, I think 2024 is still going to be a good year, but we're back to a normal cycle. So um, not that I like to go down the freeway looking at the rearview mirror, but in the same sentence, I think if you look at what was done in 2019, we're kind of mirroring that in 2024. Mm -hmm. um, and then I, I think we're still on an upward trajectory. I don't see anything plateauing out or, you know, if you read the national news, the sky's falling, houses are going to crash, just wait, you're going to pick them up for pennies on the dot, not in our market. I mean, we have multiple offers on stuff. Uh, I mean, what Sunday I had 10 offers on a house that I started showing at 1 p.m. Saturday. So oh. It, yeah. if, if you're going to wait, you're just burning more money. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I really do appreciate you taking the time to uh, talk with us today, um, you know, and, and wish you a good, you know, 2024 and, and beyond. Yeah, no, th thanks for having me. Um, great show. I hope everybody tunes in and watches more of your episodes and I'll do anything I can to help you uh, grow your podcast and, and what you're trying to accomplish, guys. I want to thank Richard for joining us today and remember to give Redline Realty a follow on Instagram. I've included a link in the episode description. So once again, if you think you or someone else on your team has an incredible story or real estate tips to share with our community, send us a message at feedback at smartagents.com. Well, that wraps things up for this episode, but remember, follow the show wherever you listen to podcasts and make sure to subscribe to the Smart Agents YouTube channel. Again, I'm Michael Walter and we'll see you on the next episode.